So, hello everyone. Um, so today we have a guest lecture. We have Marco Schleffer here. He's a principal investigator in the Future Cities Laboratory. And he will talk about uh, urban complexity or complexity science. Mm -hmm. And uh, Gerhard is today in a, in a trip, but he will be here next week. And then next week we will look at the uh, results of the second exercise. Great, so okay. please. Mark. Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction. So hello everybody. So it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk a little bit about my research at the uh, ETH Future Cities Lab uh, in Singapore, uh, where I lead like the, uh, a project or the, a small group on urban complexity. So the uh, goal for today is to get you a little bit familiar with uh, the basics of uh, complexity science, of what, com of what we mean if you're talking about a complex system at all. And then also to show you a few very recent examples of my own research in this direction. <coughs> so did some of you already see the MOOC on complexity science or not yet? So, okay, so not, not that many. Because, uh, yeah, so for you maybe some of the slides might be a little bit repetitive, but I try and keep it short. And so, anyway. Okay, so let me start with this picture from Times Square of, uh, in New York. So this should just illustrate the, that, that cities are a complex system uh, par excellence. It uh, consists not only of the, of the buildings, of course, and of the roads, but it's much more than that. It's much more the result of uh, many, many local interactions of people with, and uh, social networks with, uh, with different infrastructural networks, of course. And uh, so this, these interactions is like a very important aspect of complex systems that I will show you a little bit later. So uh, why are we doing this research? Uh, so I think you're probably very familiar with these types of graphs that cities are growing and so cities are becoming larger and larger and this adds to the complexity. And uh, the cities are growing due to, uh, just to, due to the population growth, but also due to trends of people that flow towards cities. And this, is, this mass urbanization is actually um, <clears throat> true for almost all regions of the world. And so as cities are growing, they're also changing their internal organization pretty drastically. So this should be illustrated here by these plots uh, where we had a um, very clear urban structure in medieval ages where we had like a, where, where cities were bounded by walls and we had a very clear center. And this very clear structure uh, continuously dissolved into much more intrinsic spatial organizations as shown here by this visualization of people flows in, um, I think it's Riyadh. So today we are faced with, uh, with uh, this type of uh, spatial organizations where we have many, many centers and sub-centers that trigger hard to predict people flows. And understanding this type of structure, these dynamics of cities is becoming ever more important. So we want to optimize urban mobility. We want to avoid congestion. We want to make sure that people have access to jobs that they are moving, can move around fast in the cities, in the city. And we also want to uh, design more sustainable infrastructures in general, like uh, energy, more sustainable energy, energy, structure, energy infrastructures. So there is an urgent need for a better quantitative understanding of cities in general. <coughs> and uh, complexity science, together with its combination with big data, is one way of tackling uh, this uh, question of whether we can cities better understand. And then this is, so the following slides are taken from the MOOC on smart cities. So uh, it's a bit repetitive maybe. And, but I just want to go through it very quickly for those of you who didn't see the MOOC. And um, they should just explain what complex systems are. And a good start is to just come up with some examples from biology. So like a prime or very classic examples is an ant colony. An, an ant 
the single ant is a very, very, quite a simple entity. It has a tiny brain, but together uh, an ant colony is able, very much able to perform very complicated tasks like, uh, you know, like digging a tunnel or even building a bridge as, as shown here. And the important thing, which is very typical for complex systems, is that there is no centralized control. So there is no leader ant who gives like, who is controlling uh, the, uh, uh, or is planning basically how to construct such a bridge. But uh, <coughs> these tasks, they emerge basically from the very local interactions of each individual ant. And the uh, second very classic example of a complex system is the human brain. So again, very similar to the ant colony, uh, uh, the human brain consists of uh, billions, I think about 100 billion uh, neurons, which in itself are quite, uh, <coughs> quite uh, simple entities, but together they uh, can uh, collectively uh, self-organize in such a way that, that we have things like uh, cognition uh, or intelligence. So based on these examples, uh, I just want to provide you a, a list of uh, typical or of characteristics of a complex system. And there's no, there's of course no common, uh, common definition of what a complex system is, but these points are maybe uh, the most important ones that many people would agree upon. So first of all, a complex system consists of many components. These components are relatively simple in that sense. So in a city, this might be the people or the buildings or road segments and so on. Then the second aspect <coughs> is that this, all this, or these components are interacting with each other and they might interact in a nonlinear uh, way and an example in a city, for instance, is that if you open like a new shop or if you open like a new train station to a location, then you have many more people visiting these locations and more social contacts uh, emerge. You trigger more traffic, which then may be attractive for opening yet another store and so on. So you have all these uh, non-trivial interactions uh, in cities. So I just need to check my notes. Where I so that I will be comprehensive and um, yes. So the next point is what I what I've shown you with the uh, with the example of the ant colony is that there's no centralized control. So also in cities you might have like top down planning in some of the cities, which is very strong. You have a very strong government who is planning where centers should be, but you still have the people in there and every every person is trying to optimize his life, right? So where he lives, where he's going to the gym and so on. And so despite some top-down planning, you still have a lot of, uh, of, of uh, bottom-up or uh, self-organized control in a city. Then fourth, uh, very important aspect of complex system is the so-called emergent behavior. And uh, so emergent behavior is uh, means basically, it sounds quite fancy, but it basically means that we cannot easily uh, <coughs> uh, predict the overall system behavior from the behavior of the components alone. And uh, so here we, we might also say that the uh, behavior of the system is more than the sum of its parts. That's emergent behavior. And uh, finally, complex systems such as cities, they evolve over time and also adapt. They're able to adapt to changes in their uh, environment. Okay, so what is complexity science then about? So complexity science, your overall goal is to get a better understanding of those systems. And uh, so more specifically is that we want to reveal that we want to see whether there are some statistical regularities in the overall behavior of a system. And we want to derive simple rules, mathematical rules that are able to explain, that give like a mechanism for this overall behavior of system. And that these rules are also allowing us to predict to some degree at least 
the behavior of a complex system. Very general, the approach is usually a system level approach. So uh, complexity science is more interested in a big picture view, not in the very, very details of each, uh, each individual. And it applies a broad range of different uh, scientific methods and tools. And examples here are uh, is, uh, uh, scaling theory. Scaling theory relates the performance of a system to its size. Then network theory, which is looking at interactions, basically, and the structure of interactions and the dynamics of interactions between different individuals in a complex system. And uh, another example is agent-based modeling and many more approaches from uh, theoretical physics also. And one last very important aspect of complexity science is the learning from different disciplines. So in the case of cities, we, we, for instance, we can ask to what extent is a city similar to a living organism in the way a city uh, evolves and adapts to changes in the environment. Okay, so this was just a very generic and very fast introduction into, uh, into the basics of complexity science. And so we, we can then com combine this approach with uh, big data. Uh, there's like this growing availability of human activity data in cities you are familiar of, with, I'm sure. And uh, yeah, here are some examples of, of uh, different data sources like mobile phone data or smart car data from public transportation that give us information how people flow through cities, also GPS traces, location-based social networks, Foursquare in the past was, that was very helpful to see that people check in what they are doing also, so it gives more context to it. Uh, Twitter, of course, then uh, also OpenStreetMap is very, very useful here. And also cities are actually opening up more and more their, their data to the public. And uh, so like in the next few slides, I wanna show you a few examples of what we can learn of what we can do with, with mobile phone data. And uh, just like following a discussion before, I just wanna show you where we can get this type of data. There are like different ways. So some of, some of these data, anonymized, of course, uh, mobile phone data is open, is open freely, publicly, basically. So you can download it, and uh, this is an example here, the link doesn't work, doesn't matter, from, uh, <coughs> from Italy. So there's open data, and then there's another possibility, which is like so-called big data research competition. So, Telecom operators are opening up their mobile phone data for, uh, for like a, you know, like a for research competition. And um, <clears throat> so as, as a researcher, you get like this data and you can basically do what you want and then you submit your research project and the, da the data provider then also gets new ideas for possible businesses and so on. So I think that's a really win-win uh, situation here. And so that was the case, for instance, for Orange. Orange is like the, one of the largest, at least, data provider in, in Western Africa and France also. And they opened up data for Ivory Coast and also for Senegal. And that's, that's very, very cool data to work with. And then you can also approach uh, telco providers. So in many cases, telco pro telecommunication providers have their own research labs, so they are also interested in, in working together with, uh, with uh, research institutions, of course. Okay, so this is mobile phone data and I wanna start. So now I wanna show you a few examples of what I'm working on. And so this is still um, uh, very much working progress. And so the first project I wanna demonstrate to you is like the collective movements of, of people in cities. And uh, so that's basically the starting position. It's just like this nice video. Uh, it's a bit, doesn't matter. So this is like New York. It just shows like different locations. It basically shows that different places in a city attract different numbers of people. People are coming and going. Some are, you know, like many of those people are tourists, while as taxi drivers are coming here every day. And so you have this very complicated mix. and. For urban planning and design, it's very important whether we can actually predict uh, these flows 
in a city and these collective flows, this very chaotic looking mix of people. And so to that end, we can first measure it and we can use cell phone data to measure these flows of people. And this uh, slide here just shows you how simple it is actually. Uh, so this is here on the left is like a typical <coughs> typical, you know, like a small mobile phone data set. It's very, uh, it, it's very clear, it consists of a user ID, so it's an anonymized cell phone number, basically. A timestamp, the cell tower ID, I think it's at the end, yeah, and that's it, yeah, user ID, timestamp, and cell tower ID, right? And then if you have the location, latitude, longitude from the cell tower ID, you can approximate the, uh, <coughs> the influence area of each cell tower in a Voronoi diagram. And this is this one here. So in the middle of each of these polygons here is a cell phone tower. And with this simple data here, you can then plot it uh, in that way on a map. And you can see how the user moves around in space. Very, very simple, right? And so you can, so we are usually not interested in, uh, or we are not interested in, uh, in a single individual. In urban planning, we are more interested in the collective movement of people, how, you know, like how, how the entire populations move. And so we can do that with, with we can basically sum up all these uh, individual movements. And then we can ask very, very basic questions like, how many people visit a given location? From how far do they come? And also, how often do they visit? So that's, you know, like, for the collective movement, these are, the, these are very, very basic questions. But we can only answer them now as we have basically the sensors, the cell phone data. So we can do that. And so we did this with, like, uh, data from Boston. And we had here about 2 million mobile phone users over four months. So that we had about 10 billion location, uh, no, 1 billion, sorry, uh, location-based records per month. And that was based on triangulation. And uh, that means that uh, we don't have triangulation, means that you can estimate the exact location of a user if you have the signal from three different cell towers. And uh, so we gridded the entire area in 500 times 500 meter grid cells, right? And then to answer this question, how many people from how far and how often, we just applied this very simple uh, algorithm. So we picked, we picked a location, which could be like the center of, of Boston, here the red one. And then we asked who is living like a distance or away, which could be like five kilometers away or five kilometers. And then we determined all those people and then we were asking what's the subset of the people that are living in the, at this distance and visiting this location once a month, right? And then we have like these three guys. They're visiting the you know, center of Boston, like once a month. And we are asking how many people are visiting the same location two times a month, and we have these two guys, so we have three, then we have two, and so on, like three times a month, we have this single guy visiting this location uh, three, three times a month. So applying that to the greater Boston area, we can then uh, produce a very uh, simple maps. And so this map highlights for each location. So basically each pixel here is a, is a, is a 500 times 500 meter grid cells. I think for this particular picture it was one square kilometer, but it doesn't matter. So, so each pixel is a grid cell, and the brightness of a pixel corresponds to how many people are visiting this grid cell, right? And so we are keeping the distance and the frequency fixed, so we are asking, how many people are visiting from two kilometers and two times a month? R is the uh, visiting distance and F is the visiting frequency. And then we just count, right? And we would say, okay, in Boston, you can see Boston is very bright. And you can say, okay, Boston downtown, maybe, you know, like 1,000 people are, are visiting. And this is what we are plotting here. Very simple. Is this clear so far? Okay, so we can now start to play around and we can ask what happens if we increase the visiting distance. And um, so what we can see is that the 
that these panels get less and less bright, so we have less and less visitors from further away, which makes intuitive sense, right? So if you would ask how many people in this room are living like one kilometer away, then I would guess like many of you are living in the city of Zurich, and then the further we go, the less people are coming, right? So there are maybe not so many people coming here from Geneva on a daily basis, for instance. And that's basically uh, well known, so that's, that's the so-called gravity law. I don't know whether you, you're familiar with that, okay. So, yeah, so that's basically known since like, I don't know, like 100, more than 100 years, and there have been many studies, and that was also quite simple to, to measure, but you can also measure that with census data where people live and where they work, for instance. But what's actually nice now and new with the cell phone data is that we can do the same thing for the visiting frequency because in contrast to census data where, which gives you only where the people live and where they work, with the cell phone data you also have the information of how often, how many days, you know, like people are visiting a location. And so we can do exactly the same here. <coughs> And so we can, instead of doubling the visiting distance from left to right, we can now double the visiting frequency. So we can ask how many people are visiting from two kilometers and four times a month, and how many people are visiting from two kilometers and eight times a month, right? And so we can exceed exactly the same qualitative behavior, so the picture gets less bright, so we have less visitor with increasing visiting frequency. And so we can builds the entire phase space here. So increasing what happens with increasing visiting, visiting frequency and what happens with increasing visiting distance. Okay, and so this might already be interesting, interesting if you wanna open a certain type of shop like, you know, like a Starbucks or, or, and so on. And, but what's, what's more <coughs> interesting than for urban planning is whether we can see a pattern in this picture and such a pattern would then allow us also to predict the entire distance frequency distribution to a given location. And so to tackle such a problem, there's uh, from, from uh, engineering and physics is a very, you know, like a very basic approach is dimensional analysis, where you try to reduce the number of uh, parameters. So you ask, so I don't know who, who of you is familiar with dimensional analysis? A little bit, not so much. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically very simple. It it's basically says if you can, you, you try to find, uh, you try to build from the independent variables, you try to build a dimensionless number. And so you can express the uh, dependent variable as a function of a dimensional variable, then uh, you can reduce the number of independent uh, parameters, basically. And so to do so, you ask, okay, what's the number of visitors? What are the, what are the factors that affect the number of visitors? It's the visiting distance, as we have seen, the visiting frequency. It's also how fast people are able to move to different locations, which we call the travel speed U. And then a whole bunch of socioeconomic indicators, you know, whether there's like a restaurant or whether there's like a museum or, or whatever. <coughs> But the important thing is if you assume that the Y, the socioeconomic features, are not so much dependent on time, you see that the only variables that contain time is U and F, and one way to build the dimensionless variables is the distance times frequency, which has the uh, dimension of uh, velocity, divided by U. And so the guess is that the number of people visiting a location is not a function of distance and frequency alone, but a function of the product of distance and frequency. So, if we go back, we can see in our picture that at least visually, this seems to be very much the case. So that means that number of people coming from four kilometers visiting two times a month is the same number of people that are visiting from two kilometers and four times a month, or number of people from two kilometers and eight times a month is the same number as from four kilometers and four times a month is the same number as from eight kilometers and two times a month. So if you multiply R and F, you get V, which we call the drift or velocity, visiting velocity, 
you always have the same number of visitors for this product. Okay, so always in the diagonal, the panels look very much alike. And so we can do this, plot this more systematically. This is now Newbury Street. This is a very, <coughs> very uh, famous, uh, it's basically the Bahnhofstrasse for, for Boston. And so what we plot here is just a number of visitor, visitor influx, just a count as a function of the visiting distance, and then four different visiting frequencies, right? So this black point here means these are the number of people that are visiting from like between one and two kilometers with uh, once, once a month, with frequency once a month, right? So, okay, so you get like this picture. And so if we plot the same thing, not against the visiting distance, but against visiting distance times frequency, it collapses onto a single curve. So we have one single relation and we can reduce this two-dimensional phase space into one single dimension, which makes our lives much easier, right? So if you know how many people are coming from five kilometers into four times a month, you immediately know how many people are coming from 10 kilometers and two times a month and so on, right? So all the data collapses onto a single curve. Okay, so now <coughs> that's already nice because uh, we can have already something, we can already predict to some degree the influx, but what's more, what would be even better is that if we would know what's the slope of this curve, because if we then know one single point here, we can predict everything. So how many people are visiting with which distance and which frequency. And um, so we ask what's the functional form. And to tackle this question, we again applied a very simple model. This is again like as an introduction of this complexity sense that we tried to come up with very simple rules and models that try to predict this, this system. And so what, what we did is we basically applied a, it's like a well basically or a vacuum cleaner. It's a very, very simple, very basic fluid dynamics equation to determine uh, that slope. And I think I don't wanna go too much into details here, but if you apply so-called first principle like conservation of mass, for instance, and radial movement of people towards the location, you get a slope of minus two and so this exactly works. I mean, so you predict the slope of minus two, and so if you fit the curve, that, that's very much the case here for Newbury Street in Boston. So we can derive the entire distribution of how many people are visiting from which distance and with which frequency with very simple assumptions, which, yes. And so that's true basically for this, uh, for, uh, this specific location, of course, only for like Newbury Street. So we can ask, so yeah, before that, maybe this slide, sorry. So that means that we can condense the three questions, how many from how far, how often into a single one, how many, or like, you know, also just, we can even go further than that and just have like one point on the entire distribution and then predict everything. And so then we can look at the behavior of different locations. And these are like, just like the 30 top locations, 30 most visiting locations. I can show you many more in greater Boston. And uh, you can see that almost all locations look the same. So there's a very universal behavior. But then you may ask, okay, that's maybe, you know, like you have like cell phone data and they could be biased and uh, people make calls at certain, um, <clears throat> at certain uh, days of the, at certain times of the day and so on. And therefore it's very important to test this on the very different uh, conditions and different socioeconomic conditions also. So uh, we applied it to Portugal, which you know is very different in, in terms of cities or this. Yeah, I mean, okay, Boston is a very, it's quite a European type of cities in that sense, but, but still, I mean, it's, it's like, uh, it's an American city, it's more, maybe more car oriented, I don't know. But interestingly here is that in Portugal also the locations follow this uh, inverse square law rule. So again, you can apply the same prediction here and it works also for Portugal. Senegal, that was the data from the, this data for development challenge. Like this is like open data, you can, can download, I think maybe, maybe not. 
And uh, the interesting thing here is, again, Senegal, despite being very different, you know, like in, in the social economic conditions, it still follows very much that rule. So there seems to be something very universal going on in terms of, and it also makes intuitive sense because uh, like whether you're living in somewhere in Boston or in Senegal, you still try to, to optimize where you live, where you go to work, where you go to the, to, to the groceries and uh, where you go to the cinema and so on. But the interesting thing is that every person is basically optimizing that for itself and what you can see is these very clear regularities at the collective level. And so Singapore, where I'm working uh, now, also, I mean, th there are some deviations, and I will talk about that, but in general, it, again, very much behaves like that. So this is just a plot, which are all the results, which summarizes all the results and just shows that, you know, like Boston and Dakar and Lisbon and Singapore are very much the same. So then are also locations with anomalous behavior that do not follow these rules, and so you can, you know, we can systematically find them, and they are also make very much sense, like the Gillette, Boston, Boston Gillette Stadium is like the largest football stadium uh, where the New England Patriots are playing. So that's a very particular location. It's unique, basically, like the airport, and the, this location attracts people from all over with... Uh, especially also from, from Boston, and therefore we see a very not so good and not so good collapse of the data. So, okay, I'm going to skip it because I think I will show you a few applications. So also when we know where people are and how they move, we can apply that to, to several problems. And uh, so one of the projects we did is uh, measuring how much air pollution people are exposed to during their, you know, like daily life. And so here we had the, uh, data from uh, Italy. And so on the next slide, this is Rome. And so the color basically shows you the uh, distribution of people in the city of Rome during a typical day. And so we're now in the morning hours. And so you can see that people basically flow more towards the center. So the red is more concentrated in the, in the center. And so, uh, then in the afternoon hours and later after evening or early evening hours, people are flowing out again and you can see, okay, it's more dispersed now again. So it just shows you that, you know, like with the cell phone data, you can, you can really uh, um, visualize and measure or quantify the, uh, the hourly, the hourly or even more fine distribution of people in cities. And so the idea is uh, with the air pollution exposure assessment is that before people doing this type of analysis, the only data they had was like census data, so they knew where people lived or where they work, but they didn't know, you know, like where they are in between and so on. So they used very static maps. So they had very, they had time dependent uh, air pollution concentration maps, but not no dynamic population maps. And so our idea was just to combine basically the map we've seen before with a dynamic map of the air pollution and so we get a much more accurate uh, estimate of, of the air pollution exposures of people. Okay, I think that's it. Uh, and so, yeah, so we can then compare also, you know, like where the hotspots are of uh, where, where most many people are exposed to air pollution so that we can guide or inform, you know, decisions on, on where to, to put some improvements here. And the second application from the, you know, like mobility patterns derived from cell phone data is that they can also improve infrastructure planning and that we can design more sustainable infrastructure. And this is an example for uh, Senegal. Uh, so that was, uh, so Senegal is an interesting example because uh, the level of electrification is very low. So like less than 30% of the people in, I think on average have access to electricity and it's very low in the rural areas. But almost everybody carries a cell phone, right? And so this is like the comparison of the, uh, the uh, mobile phone or cell phone infrastructure with the uh, electricity infrastructure. So the cell phone towers are the, well, the cell phone towers are the blue dots here and they are basically sprinkled all over. 
And so they serve basically as sensors in the, in the country. So we know where human activity takes place at which times of the day, right? And the idea here is because for electricity infrastructure planning, because it's so expensive to, to put new lines, you really want to know what's the demand, what's the actual electricity demand. And one difficulty is that census data, especially in developing countries, is very often it's outdated and it gives you also a very static picture. And so what we did is actually we used the cell phone data to get a more accurate more accurate picture of where people are at which times and that we translate that into an electricity demand. And so we had also from, from locations that had electricity, we could compare uh, electricity demand curves over the day with cell phone uh, activity curves. And then the idea is that we could then uh, translate the uh, activity curves of, or at different mobile phone tower locations into electricity demand and come up with a recommendation of how much electricity is, is needed and which electricity infrastructure is actually the most economically suitable for different locations. So we tested then different electrification options like medium voltage grid extension and microgrids or photovoltaics. Okay. And so going a little bit away from now uh, from uh, mobility patterns, I just want to show you a last example of what you also can do with cell phone data and that's looking at social interactions basically. Of, and that was like an, an older project. And uh, the starting graph position here is that there, again, there are very clear regularities that we have about, that with each doubling of a city, of the city size, we have about 15% more, we have about 15% gains in productivity, but also in, um, <coughs> in a, a number of uh, contagious uh, disease cases, so, and crime, and patents. So, so we have, uh, so, so basically if you plot uh, the um, a different socioeconomic indicator, the ones I said before, against the city population size, you see that these outputs of city do not increase linearly with city size, but they increase faster than linear, which we call superlinear, right? So that there's a very, so these this points here, here on the left side, they are for different uh, metrics and for different cities around the world, and that seems to be a very universal rule that applies again for crime, GDP, income, patents, and so on. And so because it applies to so many different socioeconomic indicators, the hypothesis is that the underlying network of social interactions that might help us to explain this acceleration of uh, socioeconomic output with growing cities. And so we can test this, so we can test whether human interaction, I mean, we can look at least at the uh, at the network of human interactions by using cell phone connections as a, as a proxy. That's like data from 2006 where people used more often their cell phone for calls and SMS. And so we did this for, for uh, Portugal and this is just a visualization of an average person, of the number of contacts of an average person in Lisbon on the left versus an average person in Lisbon, which is a much smaller location in, in Portugal. And you can already see here from this visualization that the per, an average person in Lisbon has, has much more contacts than an average person in, in Lisbon, Portugal. And yeah, just briefly, so this is already a result from our study, is that uh, again, that social interactions measured by cell phone contacts, that they are scaling, that they, are, they also show the superlinear scaling I showed before, that they are like with each doubling of a city of about 12% more contacts on average. And so that's not the proof, of course, and it's, uh, but it just uh, helps us to, to uh, you know, like it's, it's a further, it hints that this hypothesis that social interactions are behind this acceleration of, of outputs of cities. Uh, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Is, is there some kind of natural separation or? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, so I didn't see that here in this data. 
Yeah, no, I would be very interested, yeah. Because there is this theory that you cannot have like more than 100 friends or so, right? Like there's like this Dunbar number. And uh, so, you know, I mean, that that's, was just like a first glimpse and it's also, you know, so, so these this, this plots of these data points are just accumulated over, I think like over 14 months or so. So we don't really see whether, you know, whether you exchange your friends and that's very hard to see from the data, but it would be very interested that, you know, like during a given time span, you have the same amount of, you know, acquaintances, I would say. It's not only friends, it could be anything, right? It could also be like business partners or anything. So we don't see that in the data, but you could basically imagine that during like one month, you always have like the same size, the same circle size, but you just start to exchange members of this circle more quickly. That could be, we, I, I didn't see that, I tried to look at it, but the data didn't allow to, it's, it's too, it was too coarse grained. And um, yeah, so I, there were some follow up studies actually. And it's also, you know, there's also the danger that this is bias data and so on. But there were some uh, uh, a number of follow up studies that did confirm again this, this superlinear behavior. And I, I, I'm also aware of a paper which is still in the pipeline that actually tries to explain this with uh, keeping your circle constant, but then just exchanging the number of people. It, it wasn't published so far. And okay, so uh, I should finish or? <laughs> okay. And uh, so. <coughs> A last, I think this is a last example, just showing you that I'm not only working with cell phone data, but also looking at the, the built environment of cities, is that we, that we are looking of uh, how building morphologies change as cities grow, and we can again here apply this uh, uh, theory of scaling, which is very typical for complexity science. So here we can ask how do building geometries change as cities grow and like a first indicator is building heights and to do so we uh, collected about 10 million or like the geometries of about 10 million buildings in North America for about so now we have about 52 cities in North America this is, these are not these are a little bit less here in this plot this is an older plot but what you can then do again is to plot the average height, building height, how they are coming up against city population size, and you can see that there's a very clear relation. I mean, you know, like you would say, okay, that's nothing very spectacular. You would expect that, that buildings are becoming taller, but what's interesting is that so in a very clear and very predictable fashion. And uh, yeah, just to show you a few, so that's maybe more for the architects. Uh, that these outliers here, these are really crazy cities. This is like Cape Coral in Florida. It's a very, it's huge. It's like almost like about 700,000 people, uh, but it's just like a huge stretch of like one story buildings. And it's basically not the city as such, but more like a retiree homes. And um, okay, so yeah, I think I'm not going into too much detail here. So again, you can use this scaling theory that relates the performance of a city to its size. And you can come up with a prediction, which also goes into this direction of this 15% rule I showed you before. And you can basically apply the same to building morphologies. And what this plot should show you is that the prediction works pretty well, except the, uh, so this is the radius from the city center so this predict prediction for cities works pretty well, except the, the very downtown where you have very high buildings. And we have some explanation for that. Okay, so this is building size distribution in different cities. You can see that the statistical distributions are shifting. And so to the, so here from the left side, we have Santa Fe, the blue one, which is pretty small and you have a clear peak. So this is about one story. So most people, most buildings have one story and you can see second peak at about two stories and so on. And then, you know, like for LA, you have like a peak here and then New York is the one on the further right side. Anyway, so what's also besides just looking at height and predicting height, um, which you can use, you know, also for cities of the developing countries, basically try to 
to predict how tall they should become and they will become, you can then also predict how much traffic it will trigger and so on. And so, but anyway, so besides building a height, you can also look at building shapes. And one interesting aspect is, is surface to volume ratio, which is, uh, is an important factor for cr controlling the climate in, in, in buildings and, you know, like the energy exchange with the environment. And uh, so what you can see actually <coughs> by looking at these 10 million buildings is that if you have a very small or very small, like a smaller city, so at least in the US, then buildings are more like a sheet, uh, like a sheet of papers are very flat, basically one story. And then as cities are becoming taller, they're coming up, or they are more resembling a, a, a cube, which has like the minimum surface to volume ratio. And then if you increase the city even further, you go to very needle-like stru structures, which are very bad. In t I, mean bad I mean, they have just like a high surface to volume ratio, which you need to be aware of. So if you build this very, high uh, buildings and, uh, and then you should be aware that you need to co do more for the climate control in buildings. And uh, yeah, I think I will stop here. So just let me know if you have any questions or. Okay, good, yeah, good, thanks guys. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, he's going to show you now the, the results of the second exercise. So, do you remember which one this was this exercise? Which one? <laughs> the one of the data collection. So, uh, Lucas, um, he... Oh, wait, he's here. Okay, show it. Okay. He created... Um, So he collected, he took all the information collected, not only from you guys, but also from the MOOC participants, and he created this uh, online map where we wanted to visualize all the answers at the same time uh, around the world. Um, Thank you. <laughs> so, <clears throat> actually, what you can see here is the <clears throat> all the points that have been collected. Um, and if you remember, you had to measure temperature and measure noise and also indicate how warm you feel and how noisy you feel the environment is and the general um, <coughs> satisfaction. And we can now show here the measured temperature, which is <coughs> a bit lower in the north and warmer at the equator. But it also depends on the daytime that the temperature was measured. So actually you can click on such a bubble here and you see what the daylight line was at that time. So, and you see it was on October 29th and the measured temperature was actually 26. And if you go here to the very warm bubble, measured temperature was 37 at around noon. Uh, or for instance, here we have measured temperature minus one. So that was just the measured temperature perceived temperature is a bit warmer here, so we have four and not zero or one, etc. So you, actually you can explore this map. Uh, the link has been sent around in the MOOC, in the MOOC. Uh, description. And, and I will send it today to you guys, but you should have received the email from the MOOC, so that you can see the link there.
And then uh, I remember there were uh, some questions when we did the exercise here from you guys regarding the, the purpose of this exercise and also because, of course, there were some um, uh, questions regarding uh, that people use different tools to record these elements and, and so on, so it's a kind of a bias. But uh, we wanted to explain that the, the idea of the, of the exercise was not really to to compare or to, or, or to really do statistics out of all of this data that we collected. But on one hand was to show the participants and also you guys a method uh, that you can use to record data around the, the, the city. And also we wanted to create this map uh, just so the, the people that uh, answered these questions or collected this data can go to all other uh, uh, points in this case, and then they can also see what other people perceive, for example. And also not comparing from one point to another, but also comparing between uh, what they measured and what they perceived. So in one data, what they measured and what perceived. And, and this is also, as the other tool, as the CUA kit, this is a prototype, this is an ongoing uh, research. So any feedback that we can get from you guys, it's very welcome. So if you have any questions regarding it or, or if you have any ideas of what, how we can push it forward, just please say so. Great. Nothing popping up now? Yeah? <laughs> a picture. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a very good idea. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I can say it's a really good idea, but then I look at him asking, is it possible? <laughs> Great. Sure. Okay. Okay, any, any other feedback, comment? Um, also to Marcus, maybe? Anything? You can also learn. Yes, of course. Okay, so I think... We're finished now, so thank you and see you next week.